Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight as we continue on into the next section of Daniel 9. It's the last few verses. It's verse 24 through 27. And if you did not get a copy of notes and would like one, please uh, let me know. And I'd be glad to uh, have Weva and Usher and see if they would need to uh, help you there. Uh, if you'd like notes. Otherwise, Daniel 9 is where we're going to be. And uh, we're looking at verse 24 tonight. You say, wait, we're only looking at one verse? Uh, yes, we're only looking at one verse. And the reason is because this one verse already has a lot in it. And the next three verses after it also have a lot in it as well. So we're going to look at just 24. But I am going to read verses uh, 20 down through verse 24, just to give some context from where we were this morning to where we are tonight. Daniel 9 verse 20 says this, And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision, excuse me, in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth, and I come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter. And consider the vision. And then our text for tonight. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish an end of sins. Excuse me, to finish the transgressions and to make an end of sins. And to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So, Daniel... 9, 24, and through 27, as Pastor said, has been called the crown jewels of the book of Daniel, and most certainly, uh, so certainly is rightly described as such. But I texted a picture of this to my family members when I started reading some commentaries on this text. When I read the following statement, these are four of the most controversial verses in the Bible, and another scholar wrote, it is the most difficult text in the book. And I was like, great, that's where I'm going to be preaching Sunday night. While it is definitely most precious, there is no question, there are a range of interpretations of it, and um, not all of them are right. So tonight, I'm actually going to be a little more didactic in that I'm going to actually try to teach more tonight as opposed to preach, if you will, and I do tend to see a difference between those two. Tonight, I want to try to explain to you a little bit about where this text is and where we're going as far as what we believe in eschatology, which is the doctrine of the last things, the doctrine of the end times. So as I said, this is definitely very controversial, and there's a lot of difficult aspects to this verse. But Pastor set the table for us easily uh, this morning as he was describing to us the result of Daniel's prayer. Daniel had spent this time pouring out his heart before God. And if you want a booklet that helps discuss and encourage you and exhort you towards praying and how you can pray in the same way that Daniel did, I highly encourage you to pick up one of these. It's for, there's a free e-download on our website if that's helpful to you, or I believe we do have some printed versions of it, a book on, or a little devotional book on the seasons of prevailing prayer by Pastor Dixon. Very helpful, and very uh, helpful in meditating on this particular text. But he's, his conclusion was, while Daniel was praying, an angel comes to him. It's almost as if, if you can just vision this in your mind, Daniel is on his knees, pouring out his heart before the Lord. He's just pouring out his heart, confessing his personal sins, as Pastor mentioned this morning, and confessing the sins of his people. And if you were writing a movie script, you might not necessarily think that this would be the perfect way to enter in the dramatic moment where that prayer is answered. You know, if you were writing your movie script of Daniel 9, you would probably put in this dramatic, um, reflective, meditative music, mood music as Daniel's pouring out his heart before the Lord. 
and confessing the sins of he and his people as he recognizes that he and his covenant people had not been faithful to their covenant-keeping God and their covenant-keeping God had kept his promise. Namely, that if they refused to obey him, they would experience his judgment. So if you were making a movie of this scene, Daniel is finally pouring out his heart and all of a sudden there comes this m- music where he, he finishes praying and then you hear something. It's almost as if the music is coming in the background and somebody is coming and all of a sudden here comes this messenger into the room. But instead, the Lord in his infinite wisdom, as he has Daniel write this down, says, no, Daniel is in the middle of his prayer, pouring out his heart before the Lord and he's not even finished with his prayer yet. And boom, the angel shows up and he's probably like, whoa, what is going on here? And it says in verse 20, while I was speaking and praying, This happened as I was doing this. This wasn't uh, nice, neat, and tidy. I finally finished my last prayer. I got the the amen in, and all of a sudden, then shows up the messenger. It's while I'm still speaking. I've been pouring out my heart. And by the way, Daniel, uh, as he prays from 1 through 19, is basically praying the same thing over and over again. He's constantly reminding God, to you belongs righteousness, to us belongs sin, to you belongs glory, to us belongs open shame. We have sinned against you. You have been faithful to us. We have not obeyed you. You have put your judgment on us. I mean, over and over again. It's it's the exact same thing over and over again. And so he really doesn't have a, if we were to put it in our ways, a nice tidy way of ending his prayer because he said it over and over. But here comes this angel who comes to him. And he comes to him and says, I have come to you Ever since the moment you began your supplications, verse 23, at the beginning of your supplication, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show you that you are greatly loved. Daniel, you are greatly loved. Pastor and I were talking through, as we've been going through Daniel, we have been kind of keeping tabs on where we are and and difficult passages, what do we think, and kind of weighing the options and everything like that. But one thing that we both were just marveling over is a few times, actually, in the book of Daniel, He's described by God as a man greatly loved, or if you have a different translation, a man esteemed by God. It's not just here. It's in several other places. And ever since a kid, I've noticed that, particularly in chapter 9, but I've noticed that God describes him as greatly beloved. And as a kid, I'll be honest with you, I didn't have all of the ins and outs of theology. I didn't understand everything about salvation and the fact that we are indeed accepted in the beloved, but I I knew I wanted to be described in that way. I want to have God's view of me be that of affection and love. And lo and behold, the more I study scripture, the more I realize as a Christian that is his view of me. He is loving. He is viewing me as one of his beloved children, as a uh, co-heir with Christ, and I just love that, that he describes him in that way. And then he finishes verse 23, where pastor ended this morning, saying, therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. You have, you have prayed for the years and years of captivity that you've experienced, saying, Lord, we get it. We have sinned. We've done wrong. We get it. We are in the wrong. You are in the right. Now, restore to us again the joy of our salvation, to borrow the words of Daniel. And I might add, that you'll notice at the end of verse 19, or in the middle, I guess, in verse, of verse 19, Daniel says this, O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, hearken and do. And then notice these next two words, defer not. I realized last time I didn't spend a lot of time in Daniel. I spent a lot of time outside of it, talking about the holiness of God. I didn't spend as much time on Daniel. But that one phrase is really significant, defer not. In other words, don't delay. Don't wait. <laughs> Please make this a quick reversal of your judgment. Quickly show us your joy in your people that you have made a covenant with. And one of the things that struck me is that Daniel read in Jeremiah, right, when it says in verse 2 that he had read by the books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem that all of us are thinking, okay, 70 years, so it's getting close to being done. How does he know when it's done? How many times had Israel been exiled? How many deportments were there? There were actually three. There were three deportments. So think of Daniel. 
He was in the first one at 605 B.C. when the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar ransacked Jerusalem, take, t- took all of the young people with him. And then there was another one. And then there was a third one finally in 586. There were three deportments. And Daniel had to have been wondering in his mind, which one is it? Which is the one that he's referring to that will be in captivity for 70 years? If it's the third one, namely 586 B.C., I've actually still got quite a ways to go before we finish this. If you think in terms of that, which I, again, Daniel doesn't say that he wrestled with that, but commentators have asked, is that what he might have been wrestling with? Because if it was 605 B.C., which would have been farther away, the first deportation, 70 years was pretty close to where he was at now. He would have seen that it was going to be near completion and that the Lord might restore them. But if it was the third one, I mean, you're talking about another... 15 plus years of captivity. And he's thinking, Lord, don't defer, don't wait. Please let it be, let it be soon. I don't want to be in captivity longer. We want you to, to have your glory on display in your covenant people having a right relationship with you. And I think, frankly, that is what the significance of that phrase, defer not, is. That he wants the Lord to speedily answer his prayer. And I think a great application again, from pastor's sermon is, are you praying in that way? Are you praying for the Lord to speedily answer your prayer for his namesake, not to heap it upon our lusts, not to heap it upon ourselves and our selfish desires, but because we want God's glory to be on clear display. Lord, speedily answer this request that I make in accordance with your will. Well, he got what he asked for. He got a speedily response. Here comes Gabriel, this angel, And he says, consider this vision. Think carefully about what I'm about to tell you. And then he tells him, as what some commentators have said, is one of the most controversial passages in all of the Old Testament, in all of the Bible, perhaps, and most certainly in all of Daniel. And he begins by describing, in verse 24, the purpose of this vision that he gives to him. The purpose, he says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish transgressions, and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. These are his purposes in why he's revealing what he's about to reveal. But even in verse 24, there's so many instructive things for us today, and I want us to look at that as we consider just verse 24, the introduction, frankly, to verses 25 through 27, where the meat of the prophecy is. And I think that there's two, um, two things that Gabriel, the Lord's messenger, is communicating in God's message here regarding God's purposes. Two things. I believe he's communicating God's plan to finish sin and God's plan to fulfill righteousness. So those are, if you're taking notes, those are the two points for today is God's plan to finish sin and God's plan to fulfill righteousness. All right, so what is this God's plan to finish sin? How do you get that out of Daniel chapter 24, uh, chapter 8, 9, whew, I'm doing great today, chapter 9 and verse 24? Well, Daniel hears this message from Gabriel begin with two words, 70 sevens. Now, your English translation probably says 70 weeks. Most English translations say that, but if you were to literally translate from that from the Hebrew, it would be 70 sevens. And every Bible scholar agrees that the text says 70 sevens. But that's about where the unanimity ends. There is no more agreement on what it means after that. So several questions in this text is important for us to answer. And here's some of the questions I thought of. And I hope perhaps as you're reading it, these are some of the questions you're thinking of. Number one. What are these 77s? What does that mean? What are 77s? I don't understand. Second, what does it mean that these 77s have been determined? The King James, or if you have a new King James says determined, you might have an ESV in front of you or a New American Standard in which they translate it decreed. It has been decreed. What is the significance of these 77s being determined or decreed? Third, when he says these are being determined for thy people, who, who is he referring to? Who are the your people? And then another question, what does Gabriel mean by your holy city? What do, what do these things mean? These will be foundational for helping us understand the rest of the text. 
So I'd like to attempt to answer these questions for you right now. First question, what are these 77s? Most Bible translations, like I said, probably read 70 weeks. And you may think, well, that's, that kind of explains it. 77s, if, if there's seven days in a week, it probably makes sense then that it says 70 weeks. But that's still not necessarily helpful because if it's only 70 weeks, that really is a very small, minuscule number of days we're referring to. And I don't think that the context demands that. It'll still lead you down a, a confusing path if you think it in terms of one week being seven days. That, that's not a very long time period. Seventy-sevens could refer to either seventy-sevens of years or seventy-sevens of days. It's not likely to refer to seventy-sevens of hours, seventy-sevens of seconds, seventy-seconds of minutes. Probably not that. In all likelihood, it's got to e- mean either seventy-sevens of days or seventy-sevens of years. One of those two units. And some people have completely avoided the, the, the um, difficulty in trying to determine which one it is by saying, well, actually, the 77s, they don't mean anything. They basically are just this indefinite period of time. It's just this symbolic meaning that God has used because, you know, seven's an important number in the Bible. And so God just chose to use 77s. And it doesn't really mean anything. It's just symbolic, like the rest of what we're about to look at is about. And so you can tell, if somebody starts out by saying the 77s or 70 weeks are symbolic, they're probably going to have a rough time explaining the rest of what verse 25, 26, and 27 says. It's not going to be very easy. I mean, maybe it's too easy. They could just make up whatever they want. But it's very subjective. There's no objective way in trying to explain what the rest of it means if these 77s are just this arbitrary number that was picked by Gabriel to communicate that this symbolically references something. And if so, what does it symbolically reference? I don't think that's a very satisfactory answer. Others have said, well, it actually is 77 days. You say, well, okay, that makes sense. What, What would be the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is that as you look at the rest, verse 25, 26, and 27, there seems to be this, um, this, this specific number of times that uh, is referenced, uh, specific dates that are referenced in verses 25, 26, and 27, that 70 weeks doesn't seem to make sense with because it would be very, very, very short time. So what about 77s as in 77 groups of years? So it'd be 70 groups times seven years. What about that? What do you think about that? Well, I think that that makes sense in times of years. Um, I think it's best to see this in years. So if this is 70 sevens of years, then 70 times seven is how much, math nerds? 490. 70 times seven is 490. So if you say it's 490 days... You're talking about a little over a year, right? <laughs> Not that much of a long pe- uh, time period. But if it's set 490 years, you're talking about a very extensive time period. I think that that's 490 years seems to make most sense, and I'm trying to do this without in- inserting my, my eschatological bias because I have a certain view of eschatology, and I think that 490 years definitely helps fit that view, but I'm trying to save that for the future. So I'm just at this point setting the table and saying, let's just say at this point, it's 490 years. And this number is intriguing. You say, okay, Gabriel starts out with this number, 77s. Couldn't he have just said 490? Maybe, but God's always very specific in why he communicates his message in the message in the way that he does. And I think there's no mistake that he uses 77s. To us, it may seem arbitrary. But to Daniel and any other Jewish person, I think sevens would have been a very familiar number, don't you? Think about it. People, Jewish people, were familiar with the fact that there are seven days in a week. We're familiar with that, right? But to the Jewish person, they recognized that that was rooted in what specific text of Scripture? Genesis. Genesis 1 and 2 that God had created in six days and then rested the seventh day and thereby uh, instituted the seven-day week. So the Jewish person is thinking in terms of what God has done, and God has created in six days, rested on the seventh day, so there's seven days in a week. Most of us, we just think, oh, it's seven days in a week. If you were to probably ask some random person in the street, hey, why are there seven days in a week? They probably wouldn't have any idea why. 
But for the Jewish person, he would have known very well why there were seven days in a week. So this was no surprise, seven days in a week. Further, the seventh day, what did God do? He rested. The seventh day, God rested. And that's, again, not a surprise to Jewish people because what had God then commanded his people to do? Exodus 20, one of the Ten Commandments. He says to them that you are to rest, set aside the seventh day of the week, the seventh day Saturday, as holy or set apart before him. Not only that, but then every seven years, what did the Jewish people have? They had a sabbatical year in which they were supposed to let the the land rest. And in that 70th, uh, excuse me, in that seventh year, they were also supposed to let slaves be free. In fact, I just want to mention this to you because I think this is very interesting. In Jeremiah chapter 34, Daniel, uh, Jeremiah is giving a prophecy of the Lord here. And it says in Jeremiah 34, verses 12, Therefore the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, I made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondmen, saying, At the end of seven years, let ye go every man his brother a Hebrew, which hath been sold unto thee. So let your slaves go every seven years. And when he hath served thee six years, thou shalt let him go free from thee. But your fathers hearkened not unto me, neither inclined their ear. For ye were now turned and had done right... And ye were now turned and had done right in my sight and proclaiming liberty every man to his neighbor. And ye had made a covenant before me in the house, which is called by my name. But ye turned and polluted my name and caused every man his servant and every man his handmaid, whom ye had set at liberty at their pleasure to return and brought them into subjection to be unto you for servants and for handmaids. Therefore, thus saith the Lord... Ye have not hearkened unto me in proclaiming liberty every one to his brother and every man to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim a liberty for you, saith the Lord, to the sword, to the pestilence, and to the famine. And I will make you to be removed from all the kingdoms of the earth. And I will give the men that have transgressed my covenant, which have not performed the words of the covenant which they had before me when they cut the calf and twain and passed between the parts thereof, the princes of Judah and the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs and the priests and all the people of the land which passed between the parts of the calf, I will even give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of them that seek their life and their dead bodies shall be for meat unto the fowls of the heaven and to the beasts of the earth and Zedekiah king of Judah and his princes will I give into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of them that seek their life and into the hand of the king of Babylon's armies which are gone up from before you, before, behold, I will command, saith the Lord, and cause them to return to this city, and they shall fight against it, and take it, and burn it with fire, and I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without an inhabitant. If you followed any of that, you're like, so God's going to judge them because they didn't let their slaves free? Thank you very much. God's going to judge them all because... They didn't let their slaves free? That seems a bit harsh. But you're completely misunderstanding. If you think that's harsh, you're completely misunderstanding what's happening here. Holy God. Remember, we talked about holy God. You cannot forget this. Holy God had set apart of his sovereign and free will this special people for himself. Why? Because of anything good that they had done inherently of themselves? No. Because he wanted to glorify his name He wanted his glory to be on display for all of humanity to see. And then he set this covenant people a specific set of guidelines whereby they were to be distinguished from the rest of the pagan peoples around them. And holy God said, you are to be like me. I am completely holy, separate from humanity. You are going to represent me by being separate from the pagan people around you. And so one way you will be distinct from the pagan people around you is by every seven years letting a slave free. And if you fail to distinguish yourself from the pagan peoples around you and thus mar the illustration of my holy separateness from humanity, you will experience my just wrath. And Israel did that. 
They did not take seriously what God had told them to do. And they did not consider how serious their illustration to the rest of the world was. And so as a result, God did exactly what he told them he would do. Namely, that the pagan people would drive them out of their city and they would be overrun by the very people that they were supposed to be a testimony of God's glory to. And Daniel, when he hears 77s, this has got a sting. Because this is a reminder to him of the many sins that his people had done. To warrant the just judgment of God on his people. And thus, why he was able to rightly say, have mercy, because we're guilty. We cannot stand before you and say, you are unjustly judging us. We have rightly pictured your holiness by being utterly separate from the people who are pagan around us. Daniel knew that that wasn't true. And all he could do was say, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on us. And the Lord says, Daniel, you are greatly loved. Seventy sevens. And Daniel had to experience in that moment something of a twinge of pain. But the Lord had said, you're greatly beloved. And then he said, these people are going to experience something. And he gives these six purpose statements that are so instructive, I think, for us as well. But suffice it to say, these 77s or 70 weeks, this 490, what I believe to be years, was a very specific number that God gave to Gabriel to share with Daniel for a very specific reason. And right now, That reason will not quite come to light because we aren't looking at verses 25, 26, or 27 yet. But you'll see how it just amazingly fits together in this prophecy the Lord will give. So what are these 77s? The answer, 490 years. 77s of years. And that's 490 years. But then he says 77s are determined. What does that mean? They're determined. Like I said, if you have a New American Standard or an ESV, it probably says decreed. They have been decreed for you. And the idea here is that this has been cut out. The Hebrew word behind this English word doesn't occur anywhere else in the Old Testament. But from other uh, literature, ancient literature, we've been able to determine that the idea behind this word is something being cut out. And one commentary I read just put it so well. The idea that the Lord is trying to convey here is not only that he has sovereignly decreed that this will happen, although that most certainly is true, but that he has specifically cut out in the human history These 490 years for his own unique, special purpose. So when you read 70 weeks are determined, most of us probably in our English-speaking mind don't even realize the significance of what's being communicated here. But the idea is not only God's sovereignty in saying this is what will happen. I have decreed this will be so. But that God has specifically set these out as unique, special holy for himself. So the significance of these 77s being decreed or determined is that God has a very special purpose in these 490 units of years. And I think that these 490 units of years are going to be very, very instructive for us as New Testament people as well. But then he says, not only are they determined, but he says they're determined upon who? Your people. Who is he talking to? Well, he's talking to Daniel. So I think the best explanation of this is that the your people is a reference to Israel. These 77 weeks or 490 years are determined upon Israel. You say, why? That seems obvious to me. Apparently, it's not that obvious for some Bible scholars because some have said, well, verses 24, 25, 26, and 27, they're all prophecies concerning the church. Well, I mean... It's tempting to see that, most certainly in a New Testament age where we are the church right now. 
But you've got to keep the context in mind. He's talking to Daniel, and when he says your people, he's not talking about your people. He's talking about Daniel's people. And Daniel's people are Israel, which has to mean that God has a purpose for Israel in these 490 years. This is specific for Israel. And again, for us, because we didn't experience what Daniel experienced in 605 B.C. of the trauma as a teenager watching a foreign pagan army invade his city, take him captive, and force him to work for them. But also the fact that it was because God was judging them. And Daniel, in his mind, has to be wondering, how long are we going to be in this judgment? Has God cast us off forever? Or to borrow the words of the psalmist, has God forgotten us forever? Where are you? That the The nation of Israel had to have been wondering, we're done for now. We were God's special people, but we have sinned against him so much that at this point, I don't blame God for not wanting to do anything else with us. But then Gabriel tells Daniel, 490 years are decreed for your people. These 490 years are decreed, set apart uniquely in these 490 year span of time, specifically for your people, a.k.a. Daniel, God's not done with you and your people yet. And then what does Gabriel mean in verse 24? By upon thy holy city, upon your holy city. Well, frequently in Scripture, the holy city is a reference to Jerusalem, and I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be here as well. Daniel would have surely seen Israel as a holy city, most certainly. But why was this city holy? Because it was God's city. This is God's city. So Daniel, yes, you view Jerusalem as your holy city, but this is God's holy city. But think, then think also from Daniel's perspective. Last time he was in Jerusalem, what had happened? <laughs> Absolute carnage. What's going to happen with Jerusalem now? Is it over? Just like God perhaps was done with his people, was God now done with his holy city that he had set apart for himself? And Gabriel says, God hasn't forgotten your people. There's a 490-year time period dedicated to you and to your precious holy city that signifies the relationship that God has with his people. He's not done with you yet. And if you've wondered why Pastor and I have mentioned that this book, Daniel, was written to encourage the Israelite people, you have to understand now why. Because Daniel in his prayer is uttering these these prayers of, of repentance, of penitence to his God, saying, we deserve this. And you can feel the anguish in his soul as he wonders, is God really done with us? Maybe God is. I've seen in the scriptures how you tell your prophets that this is your covenant people with whom you've made an everlasting covenant. You made a covenant with David and you said he will be on his throne forever. And you said that there would be a seed of the woman who would come and crush the serpent's head. But honestly, I'm wondering how it's going to happen. The Lord says, I'm not done. 490 years for you and for your beloved holy city. This is God's purpose. He will accomplish his purposes. And then he lists six purpose statements that I want us to finish out this sermon with as we close. The first one is this phrase, to finish the transgression. The word transgression has the idea of a revolt against authority. Had Israel done that? Yes. Has every human who has ever existed besides the Lord Jesus Christ done that? Yes. Has resisted God's authority. Has said no to God. That's Romans 1. Rebellion. He says, in these 490 years, one of the purposes is that there will be a finishing of this rebellion. That should sound familiar. I just quoted it a little bit earlier, or at least referenced it. Genesis 3, 15. There will be a descendant of the woman who will crush the serpent's head. The curse will be reversed one day. So God has cut out this 490 years, however it's divided, however 25, 26, and 27 are interpreted. These 490 years, the purpose behind them is to finish the rebellion, the transgression. 
Number two, to make an end of sins. Just generally, this is sin, any sin against God. To make an end to sins. You could say, well, is that a reference to the fact that Israel then, once they finish their captivity, that it's their sins that he's talking about? Most certainly, I think that's included in it. But I think he's talking broader here. He's going to finish sin, ultimately. And how will he do this? What is the means whereby sin will be ultimately dealt with? That's the third phrase. To make reconciliation for iniquity. Or perhaps your translation might say to make an atonement for sin. And of course we know from the New Testament that it is through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary that humanity could experience this atoning work and then this phrase i just love this verse 24 not only to make a reconciliation for iniquity god reconciling man but to bring in everlasting righteousness don't you love that isn't that great everlasting righteousness i've i've said this several times i can't go through a day without experiencing the results of my sin nature. And I know this is probably true of every Christian, but it just sickens me, even today, just thinking about things that I might have done to wrong somebody, to think wrongly, to say something that should not have been said, to act in a way I should not have acted. I just, I frankly, I get sick of it. Because I feel the tension that Paul talks about where I want to do the right thing, but then... My, my flesh is battling against my spirit and my sinful inclinations, even though I've been freed from the penalty of sin. I've not been freed from the, the, the power, or, excuse me, of the presence of sin. I've been freed from the power, most certainly, and so I can do the right thing, but I struggle still because my sinful flesh wants to go for the sin, and the spirit within me is driving me towards righteousness, and I feel this tension, and every day the battle is waging in me, and I hate it. I think that's why that phrase, everlasting righteousness, just hits me to the very core. Because there won't be any sin anymore. There won't be that battle anymore. There will be everlasting righteousness. And all four of these purposes, these first four that we looked at, all reference God's dealings with sin. The eradication of sin which I cannot wait for. But God isn't just going to end there. Most certainly the work of Christ on the cross was a completion of his work to save mankind. Of course, that's true. But we're still in sin. We still struggle with sin. We still have the presence of sin. So what else will this 490 years do For Israel, this is the second part, not only God's plan to finish sin, but God's plan, number two, to fulfill righteousness. When will that happen, you say? Well, in a sense, the work of Christ was sufficient on the cross. We have been freed from the power of sin, but not the presence yet. One day, there will be a day when sin will be totally and utterly removed, such that there will be none in the future, when God's kingdom finally is brought back to the way he initially meant for it to be, as demonstrated in his perfect creation in Genesis 1 and 2. But his plan to fulfill righteousness is going to be through his special people, Israel. And he finishes these last two purpose statements in verse 24. Not only to bring an everlasting righteousness, which of course will happen one day in the future, but he says to seal up the vision and the prophecy. prophecy. Seal up the vision. We don't think in terms of this very often. Very few times do we ever deal with seals, not the animal. 
But seals in this time could be a reference to either a document being sealed shut with an authoritative stamp whereby the authority is being claimed on this document and this is an official document that this authority figure has deemed to be authoritative by virtue of the fact that he has sealed it. Or it could be something that simply was a seal or closing of a book. For example, Daniel uses this phrase several times in chapter 8, verse 26. It says, The vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true, wherefore shut up or seal the vision. And then in chapter 12, in verse 4, he says, But thou, O Daniel, seal up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end, which shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And then uh, down in verse number 9, he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the end of time. I think the idea is both. Here is an authority who is sealing a document that cannot be opened now. And what does he say about this fulfillment of righteousness? You can seal the vision and the prophecy. Why? Because it's going to happen. It's going to happen. There's no question. God had always kept his word, and Daniel most certainly would have known that, since he's already been dwelling on the fact that God had kept his word to judge his people because they had sinned against him. Then he says this other phrase, and to anoint the most holy. The idea is the holy of holies, uh, to anoint the holy of holies. And some have said, well, this obviously is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. But the problem is, of all the times that the holy of holies or the most holy happens in the Old Testament, it's not usually a reference to God or to Christ, the Messiah who would come but a reference to the tabernacle, to the temple, and inside where the items inside the temple were declared as the most holy. And there was the holy of holies within the tabernacle, right? All of those. That is the same wording that he uses here. And he says, I'm going to anoint the most holy. It refers to the tabernacle. And you say, well, that's kind of a weird statement. I mean, he's already been talking about fulfillment of righteousness in the future where it's, a sh- it's sure it's going to happen. You could seal this up. The authority is, has said this will happen. But to anoint the most holy, I mean, we're New Testament saints now. We're Christians. We don't have a temple anymore. We don't have an altar that we've placed on the front here that we then slaughter animals on to atone for people's sins. How is that going to work? In the future, God has said that in his kingdom, there will be a temple again. A temple again where the most holy will be. And just to give you a glimpse of it, I'll just take you to Ezekiel. There's others we could go to, but I'll take you to Ezekiel 37 and we'll finish with this. Where Ezekiel says in verse 26, well, let me back up. Let me back up in verse 21. And say unto them, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king will be king to them all. And they shall be no more two nations. Remember, the nations divide at this point. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them. So they shall be my people. And I will be their God. And David, my servant, shall be king over them And they shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. The thing that God has wanted them to do from the beginning. You'll obey. And in verse 25, they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. Notice this, verse 27. My tabernacle also 
shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, do sanctify Israel with my sanctuary, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. When is that going to happen? In the future. And the way I believe Pastor and I will interpret these verses, that there will be one day a literal reign of Jesus Christ when Satan will be bound for a thousand years, and during that thousand years, a righteous king from the throne of David who will reign with a perfect scepter, who will finally reconcile his people to himself. Can you see this? Can you see how the Lord is so excited to see that his special people who have rebelled and rebelled and rebelled against him over and over again will finally be worshiping him and serving him and obeying him and imaging the fact that he is separate before all the other people. And in that millennial reign, which is, which is in the future, there's going to be a temple signifying the same thing that Emmanuel did when he was here. God with us. And that is what Daniel is looking forward to when he sees that the Lord will anoint his most holy place, the temple, in the future. All of these to fulfill God's righteous plan to redeem people. Now, this is God's plan for Israel. Does that mean that God's forgotten about his bride, that Christ has forgotten about his bride, and that we will no longer have any kind of blessings and experience God's favor? Of course not. God will bestow upon us many blessings as well. And we all, one day, after Satan is released, he tries to throw one last rebellion, is overthrown by a word of this king who finally has his people, who will then make all things new. And there won't be any more sin. There won't be the inclination to sin. There won't be the battle within your soul over whether or not in this moment you should give in to your lust or whether or not you should submit yourself to your king, that battle will be no longer happening. And you'll finally, finally experience that everlasting peace and righteousness with Emmanuel. I can't wait. I can't wait. And so, like John said, Lord, come. We can't wait. And Lord, I thank you so much for that blessing of knowing that you will one day finish sin. And thank you so much for giving us these precious truths. Because I, you know my heart, Lord, I just struggle with my own sin and get so convicted so often. I just can't wait till it's over. Please, Lord. Do so quickly. Don't defer. Please save people. Please help our church share this wonderful reconciling news of the king who has sent a Messiah to finish transgressions and to bring in everlasting righteousness. And may people submit themselves to that king. Thank you, Lord, for these wonderful truths and how you have encouraged my heart and I hope the hearts of these, your church, for I ask it in Christ's name.